Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to a visual studies workshop of making and materiality, studio arts and the liberal arts education. Um, the workshop will take place today and tomorrow, so there'll be two lectures today. And as, as described on this program, we can all have available to you. There will be a full day's activity tomorrow, which will be at the University of Museum. And at the end of my brief introductory remarks, I'll give you a map of the location where you should go and enter the University of Museum in order to come to the, uh, to the talks and conclude uh, a discussion uh, tomorrow. So when you think of this question, of course, it depends on partly on what you mean by studio arts, partly on what you mean by liberal arts education. I'm going to say a little bit about liberal arts education, and I'm going to allow the workshop itself to define the range of art making activities that might enter into such a, the idea of such an education. So of course, when you think of liberal arts, everyone thinks of the seven liberal arts um, as um, formulated in the Middle Ages, grammar, logic, rhetoric, arithmetic, music, geometry, and astronomy. Um, that is a list that comes out of well-known documents from the Middle Ages. It's partly a grammar school curriculum more than a college arts curriculum. Um, and it's oftentimes, this idea of liberal arts is oftentimes attributed to uh, Cicero, uh, who said that these were the, it should be the studies that are worthy of a free, a free man, he said, a free person. Um, but if you actually look at Cicero, at least one, according to one um, uh, recent paper, we say recent in philosophy, we say the last 30 or 40 years. Um, so if you look at the list here on the, on the left side, on the right side, right side, then you got mathematics, music, which is a traditional liberal art, literature, which isn't included in this list, and we include also history as well as, as um, plays on literature, poetry, natural sciences, ethics, public affairs, uh, study of uh, national history and study of foreign languages. And so already in Cicero you see a wider notion of the idea of, of a liberal education or an education that's appropriate for a free person. Uh, if you go into the Middle Ages or into the uh, early modern period, then you wouldn't actually see the liberal art as part of a university or college curriculum without the discipline of philosophy. By the discipline of philosophy is meant these four areas of philosophy, moral philosophy, natural philosophy, um, logic, and metaphysics. And then in addition to those, uh, there would be the um, literary, the classical, historical studies, and grammatical studies, and so forth, which would make out not what we call then a liberal arts education, but an arts education still call it the Bachelor of Arts degree. What does that mean? It means the degree that is descended from the arts faculty of the medieval and early modern universities. Um, in the 19th century, that faculty was often called the philosophy faculty, but it included things like chemistry and physics and so forth. It was the, the faculty that came before the higher faculty which were um, medicine, law, and theology, part of the sort of revolution of uh, PhD education in the 19th century was to include an arts PhD. There was an arts PhD before that. In Germany, it became a research PhD growing out of philology seminars and then other um, humanities seminars. So in a way, it's to ask them about the role of studio arts and liberal arts education lesson arts education. So let's, let's explore that again. So if you look at this, this listing again, which is based on the scholar's interpretation of some passage in Dante, where it talks about um, liberal arts. Actually, I should go back here, because in the Dante passage, it's not the seven liberal arts, but it's also natural philosophy, metaphysics, morals, and theology. I was struck by these um, descriptors over here. The trivium as the expression of intellect, the 
the quadrivium as intellect. So it's clear the idea here is that there's a body of knowledge to be learned in arithmetic, music, and music is mainly about harmony, it's mainly music theory, geometry, um, astronomy. And these things, grammar, logic, and rhetoric, are to allow you to express whatever thoughts you have in this or any other subject. So the way you can see this as a distinction between skill at presenting some kind of material and, and uh, subject matter itself. And that's, that division between skills and, as it were, knowledge content is still, I think, part of the concept of an arts education today, or liberal arts education. I put this up here, it's the seal of the university. It's sort of funny. It sort of re-describes these things and includes the philosophy. Then it has theology up here. There never was a school of theology at the University of Pennsylvania. It's odd that that would be at the peak of our conception of the arts. There you go, that's our, that's our seal. So I compare this idea, these ideas, to the current uh, general requirement of that University of Pennsylvania, which seems to be divided between a sort of skill side, right, knowledge of a foreign language, writing requirement, formal reasoning. So it's not just it's not mathematics per se, but it's using some kind of formal reasoning structure in, with respect to some things. It's quantitative data analysis, cross-cultural analysis, cultural diversity in the United States. I was on the Committee for Undergraduate Education, and we were thinking about this general education idea, and I said, well, where's the bubble from drawing? Where's the visual art component as a, as a human, as a basic human skill? And everybody sort of chuckled. So this uh, workshop is partly to say, what would you get in a liberal arts education, liberal arts education if you had in some studio or design? arts make a component to the basic idea of the liberal education. And we'll see in one of the talks tomorrow morning that historically, of course, the 19th century, there was an idea that you were not educated unless you had uh, instruction and drawing. Uh, so that was an idea, especially for American uh, liberal arts. So you've got the sort of the skill side here, and then you've got the sectors, which are, which are the sort of knowledge categories. Knowledge of society, history and tradition, arts and letters, interdisciplinary, this stuff, living world, which is psychology and biology, physical world, physics, geology, chemistry, etc., and interdisciplinary, this stuff, like visual study 101, it's kind of interdisciplinary, uh, this stuff. And so this skill versus knowledge aspect um, is still there. And you could go back here and say, well, there might be a couple different aspects then to incorporating. Um, visual making into the arts, there's you know, be a skill aspect and an expression aspect. Uh, but then there might also be subject matters that are best treated in, this, in a visual manner. And that those are to be added here. You can see in the uh, presentations of the next few days some ideas that might bear that out. So this is the visual studies program. I should then explain it. Studies major, which actually incorporates these ideas. The official studies major is an undergraduate major at the University of Pennsylvania. It's about 15 years old. Um, it combines uh, philosophy, psychology, history of art, uh, art, uh, fine art, and design. Um, and it has three different tracks uh, called the philosophy of science of seeing, the art and culture of seeing. And um, art practice and technology, or architecture practice and technology. One of those tracks is selected here in stage three, but in stage one and two, there's a common core uh, that includes some basic courses, uh, one of them um, more focusing on philosophy, psychology, and, and history of art, and one studio course, and two courses in each sector, philosophy and psychology courses, history of art, and other uh, culture of art courses, including common courses. So forth, history of film, and so forth, and then uh, some additional uh, studio arts courses, um, and, uh, and a junior seminar, and then, and then there's uh, concentration. In this case, it was in philosophy and science. It could be in the art and culture, or it could be um, fine arts, the breadth course, and then year-long senior 
project force, and so forth. So we see this major as bridging these various curricular divides and thought divides, the fine arts science divide, the fine arts humanities divide, and the humanities and science divide. So we see it as a kind of distinctive form uh, of liberal education. And so one aspect of this conference is just to reflect on is that a good idea? Uh, what, what, what do you get out of that, uh, out of that combination? So one way to take the question that we're trying to ask, or one question we're trying to answer, is what do fine arts and design making add to a liberal arts education? So I'll say, well, skills, not material, expression, and, and, and whatever else we'll see in the course of the day and a half, whatever else there is. Of course, there are other areas of making at the university. There's the craft of experiment in science. There's written and other modes of expression in the humanities. There's museum craft in museums, and we'll have a session on museum craft tomorrow, object-based learning in the museum, uh, with uh, our workshop transfer to the museum. But these two days, we're going to focus mainly on visual fine arts and design making and the contribution that those might, might make uh, to a liberal arts education. And just a couple of announcements before we uh, begin properly. The reception following today's talk, uh, the second talk today across the hall, the topic breaking the community talks will also be across the hall. Tomorrow's talk is in the University Museum to enter through the press entrance, which is the south entrance. So here you can see the football stadium. Walk along South Street there and go around and go in there and come up to the uh, third floor, 345 signs, one play. And during the lunch break, the long lunch break tomorrow, there'll be a chance to visit the museum and also to undertake some demos with the museum staff, object based learning demos, as well as to eat lunch. <laughs> so, uh, coffee starts at 9 a.m. tomorrow at the first talk. Lunch will be provided uh, at a buffet day. So, just a thanks to the Greater Philadelphia Philosophy Consortium, the Department Department, the Philosophy Department, the Provo Center, the Spec Arts Club, the University Museum, the Wolf Humanity Center, and the Digital Studies Gift Fund for supporting uh, the event of these two days. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce the first speaker, who is Nick Susanis who has the distinction of creating the first PhD dissertation in comic book form uh, at Teachers College in Columbia, um, and who now uh, has a position at San Francisco State University in the School of Humanities and Liberal Studies, where he uh, teaches um, ways to use visual expression in relation to various subject matters. I think is the shortest summary I can give up. So please welcome me. Thanks, Gary. Uh, I think that's about the most efficient description of what I do I've ever heard. Well, it's awesome to for summary. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gary, Gary and Ian, for having me here. I'm really excited to be part of this gathering. So yeah, I did my dissertation in comics, so now this book from Harvard Press, and um, I have samples of it if you haven't seen it. We're going to see a lot of it. So the plan for today is to take a look at what I did, uh, play a little bit about how it came to be, what I did, what it's about, a little bit more about how comics work, which may take us a little of feel from what you do. Um, and then as I wrap, um, take some questions and then we're going to do an exercise together that I often do to students and public events. So, um, start with, I'm going to say, uh, you know, I didn't come to college uh, deciding to do comics that it would be cool. This is something I did as a very young child. One of those people whose first work was Batman. Um, very influenced by an older brother who was reading comics to me and reading at a very early age as a result. And I made my own superhero from junior high through high school, a locker man who makes a, a cameo appearance in my dissertation. <coughs> and it identified me uh, in my chapter on imagination. Um, I was really into making comics. It was a really important thing to me. And when I went to undergrad, at the time I went 
know, it's not something you did, it's not something you studied or made in school. And I wanted to do intellectual things. Um, and I, I need to come because it's not something I think of doing. So I studied mathematics, and I'm very pleased to have done that. It was a good experience. Um, but my comics making stayed in the background for a long time. Um, so uh, when, you're, when you tell people you do mathematics, maybe if somebody in this room has that experience, that's not a mathematician, they'll, they'll say, oh, you're so smart. Right? That's, the, that's the response you get. Um, so now I'm more known for the art I make than for, for my life. Um, and they'll say something different. they say, oh, you're so talented. And so what I think about that is, is that I was a really talented mathematician. I was very clever at figuring all the things out. How smart I was or not, I don't really know. But I think the art that I make is smart compared to what I could do without it. And I think it's really, I, mean, I think this, your program really, Thinking of what you guys are doing really speaks to that wonderfully. We have this dangerous divide in saying this is you know, this is reserved for the talented people, and the rest of you aren't supposed to draw because you're really not be stuck. <coughs> and the drawers aren't supposed to be, you know, I when I was at humanities talk uh, yesterday at Temple and I said, is there any mathematicians in the room? They all laughed. Of course not, of course not, they're not supposed to do that. Um, so a lot of my work I think speaks about that divide. So my comics remained a little bit dormant, and I kept making a lot of unfinished projects. Um, I did one for a philosophy class that didn't get finished. I did, I did a bunch of them, but um, I ran a magazine about art in Detroit, and uh, in 2004, somebody asked me to be in a political art show around the election. So I had a few days to go, so I made this comic. Um, and I was pleased with it. Uh, it was the of security. And it was very influenced by uh, Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics, which I would guess people know about comics. You know this book, and I'll, I'll say more about it in a little bit. Um, and Scott's work is certainly seminal both for comics, but also in the way that sort of informational comics could be used. So there's the avatar of Scott walking around um, describing things, and almost all educational comics since then have sort of followed. Um, I, I enjoyed this for my first one, but two weeks later we had a show after the 2004 election, um, and I, I took a different influence. Uh, this is a comic called This is Information by Alan Moore. Um, it's a 9-11 tribute anthology comic. It's a short comic. And this, instead of, instead of sort of the illustrational, this will be the visual metaphor and verbal metaphor. And the resonance between them, the resonance between every bit is powerful, they express symbolically feeling beyond the reach of language. So this, this is play going between what's going on in the image. And, and that really said, this is something productive on that. So my next comic, I quite literally smashed the narrator my face is no longer going to be part of this thing. And this comic is about voting, you know, a show of hands. Um, so the entire piece is all, is all a show of hands. Every single panel is going to have to be a hand from the state that I came from and all these other things. Um, so that I really sort of jump-started me back into making comics. We put on an art show on games and education in Detroit. And I did the, uh, I, did, I wrote the essay for it as a comic, so it's history of games. Uh, how they work and the sort of philosophy thing towards the end. And um, so this page is about comics not being just for kids. And I'm using metaphor and all these you know, recognizable images, fictional rabbits here, um, to do something that looks quite simple, it looks accessible, which it is, but it's also getting at something quite deep. Um, so that's, that's sort of the sort of cornerstones of my work, and it continues to the 2008 political comic where really felt that the language was the thing that kept us apart. The reason we had trouble, my mother-in-law was not about, we got along really well, but as soon as you introduced the names of parties or those other things, we started to have arguments about, or the conversation stopped. So here I was making fun of the idea of red and blue, and really trying to find ways through the comics to like pull out language to find common ground. So these are the things I came to, to Columbia with and said, I'm going to make comics. Um, I didn't know any better, but it was kind of a, uh, what people do. Um, but we can talk about that later. Um, and, and I'll say one more thing. All my comics going forward, I started stripping out the language of disciplines, of uh, fields. And I, was, I, I, my, I have a lot of gaps in my time in school and then out of school. And I, I think I, I really loved being in the academy, but I really had a hard time with the ideas staying there. I wanted them to go outside of that. And I felt like the biggest barrier was not one of being smart enough, but really about 
the vocabulary. And with comics, I can do these things where I could put a lot of complexity in the images, you know, and through the images and the juxtaposition of images and text and their, their interrelations. Um, so it might appear simple, but I wasn't dumbing it down. I was finding other ways to reach people. So I came to the university with that, and they accepted me. And I was fortunate enough to have Maxine Green uh, in her class in the very first term. Does anybody, a few of you are familiar with her work? Just a couple. Well, you should be. It's going to change today. No. Uh, Maxine was a philosopher of aesthetic education at, at Columbia from like 1950 to 2014, something like that. Um, I had her class in her living room when she was 90. She started a thing in uh, Lincoln Center for Educators. I'm um, a big believer that uh, the transformative powers of the arts can be engaged with the arts. Um, so I had this class in her living room, and um, I made a comic about her. And instead of drawing Maxine as she is at night, as she was at 90, um, I wanted to get something about her energy across. And I turned to metaphor quickly, and you know, instead of that she would be wheeled out, she'd be not, not feeling like she was in good shape, and then it was kind of off the dynamo. So this top, when the top is the ripcord is pulled and the top comes alive, and really captured Maxine. I was kind of hoping I had more Maxine fans in the audience. So I made up one shortly after she passed, which is qualities on our website, but we'll skip that for now. Um, Sometime after, my advisor from English education, uh, Ruth Vins, did a book on narrative research, and she said, you can have the last chapter, do what you want. So I made a comic that is either about doing research, or it's about drawing, or it's about how we see. And it totally depends on who you are or what you think I made this comic about. Um, and, and that, so it's, it's not just stripping out language, but trying to find metaphors so that you really could be open to access to different ways of interpreting what it meant, but hopefully getting you to the same kind of feeling at the end. Um, and so those, those are sort of the elements that define my work, is, is <coughs> the use of visual metaphor, the use of the comics form, and the, and the sort of absence of disciplinary language. So on flattening, uh, to, to get into what unflattening is about, I'll say a few words what I mean about flat by flatness, and I didn't mean something literal. But um, sort of narrowing of our sight, I think, you know, the sort of reverse of liberal arts education, the, the drawing is not included. Um, the, the narrowing of our sight, a narrowing of our possibilities, and because I have this word on flattening, uh, mostly from how I think about comics, I turn to flat land, and I'm guessing folks here, a few people know flat land, when they, when Adam's 1880s, the middle of flat land. If you don't, it's the story of the geometric inhabitants, so circles and squares and triangles and lines of this infinite two-dimensional plane. And they know how to move uh, east and west and south and northwards, but they have no concept of upwards. They can't conceive of anything off the plane. So you and I can look down at a flat layer and say, that's so ridiculous, up. But the question I wanted to ask is, what's upwards for us? What are the directions that we can't, we can't know about if we can't see them? Um, and so, because I was in a school of education, because I come from uh, the child of teachers, I was quite concerned what's going on in the system of education. I saw the, the, as a form of flat, a series of steps that people go through. Um, and so that our learning ends up in boxes, whether it's boxes of time, or boxes of space, or boxes of subject. So we get to a point where you think it's odd to have somebody who studies mathematics and art and possibly have to make his living as a pro tennis player for most of that time. Um, you think that that's an odd thing, but I think those artificial borders are what's odd. That we built them up, and we've had them so long that we've sort of taken them into ourselves. So I wanted to push back against that narrowing, that lining up of our thoughts, and quite specifically, because here I am doing a dissertation, push back against 12-point type double-spaced one and a half by one by one by one inch margins. <coughs> not, not because it's not good, not because it's a bad thing, but because why is this what counts and something else not? Um, you know, we, we can, philosophers here, we can look as far back as Plato, who called the images uh, shadows of shadows, and didn't trust them. You can look at Descartes, who's totally distrust of the senses, and you're throwing out all those things that we do. And I mean, for, for all the things we gained, I think we lost something about how our bodies work and how our eyes work. Um, so if you think any way you try to represent the complexity of your experience, you have to flatten things out. I can't take everything here and give it to somebody else. I have to. So if you look at something like the Mercator projection, which we're all familiar with, it's really good at navigating <coughs> the globe. It's really good for latitude. 
it's really lousy for area. You know, Greenland's not that big. You look at a different projection, you look at Duck Buckminster Fuller's that Maxian map, and if here he maps it to an icosahedron and un unfurls it, his map shows connections where this shows divides. Is this more correct? Not, not necessarily. It's just a different way of flattening it out. And so it's like asking about the weather and only talking about the temperature. I mean, at all, for, if you only give us one channel, you're leaving out things like the humidity, the wind, the cloud cover. Um, and you're giving us incomplete picture. So that became this big question for me, is what are we failing to see when we only assess, when we only test, when we only count writing as what we do? And what might we make visible when we start to introduce other ways of seeing and other ways of knowing? And because I talk about ways of seeing, in, and I do mean it in a literal sense because this is a visual work, I really meant ways of seeing in a metaphorical sense as ways of knowing. So I have this page, it's a little bit of an apology for, for that language, but also it really think it sums up the work well. So I introduced my dog into the work, and, and you know, you all know a dog sense of smell is stronger than yours. You know that. Um, but what's really true about it is more nuanced, which means I can come up here and I see the color of the wood here, I see the sharp edges, I can see those things. The dog might not see that as well. But the dog knows if somebody gave a talk here an hour ago, two hours ago, sometime this morning, yesterday, maybe back a whole week. Things that I have no idea, you know, unless they, unless they wrote it down here, I can't tell. So the dog has access to layers of time, the kind of upwards that I just don't experience. And, and that's not an argument to say we're all going to make smell, smell feces in the future. Um, but it's to say, how do we bring in those other ways of knowing, other ways of sense making, into what we did? And so the flattening was this ridiculously simple idea that, you know, this is not the same as this. And neither of them is right. But what happens when we, you know, when we bring both of those in, we see the world in a different way. Um, and we, you know, we, we, we uh, displace from sort of a narrow point to have to coming from two at the same time. And maybe that, you know, bringing in multiple points gives us a different view of the world. Um, so for me, comics was this thing that I loved to do, but it was also this way to be amphibious, to breathe in the world's image and text. And, and maybe find ways to step out and get a different look at the boundaries of my own thinking. Maybe get beyond the ways that I, that I was able to do things. And I think I see that, I think that's been very much true for my own process and with my students. Um, so we'll, we'll say some concrete words about comics for a little bit here. I mean, we're at a point where comics are, people are excited about it, they're university classes, um, there's all kinds of stuff. And we tend to see it as this sort of new phenomenon. And, and yet, it's something that's older than film in ways that we sort of recognize it as comics. And in fact, if we look through history, thing, comics like things have been around a long, long time. And I'm not going to say that this is a comic, but I am going to say that this is a way of sense making about the world that people do visually. That's as old as we've been us. And I think when we talk about what kind of literacies matter, when you've got people who snickered about drawing, like, this is one of the things that help make us be who we are, and yet you get in a room full of people, you're going to have, you know, 7% of them that say we can draw, and you're going to have the rest of them that say you don't, you can't say that about writing, nobody's going to, they won't admit to it. But it's not going to happen, because we value one and we don't value the other. But I think we're, we're doing a disservice as visual creatures to what we can actually do. So let's say a little bit about comics. I have a slide with words on it, which is really I like having these stories, but I don't really like having slides with words. Um, not that there's anything wrong with slides, but I don't <laughs> um, But we're going to talk about flatness, because a lot of what I thought about comics had to do with their ways of being less than flat. Um, and so we'll start. Those of you, there's a few people who know Scott McCloud's work here. I see a bunch of nods. It was a 1993 comic about comics. It's, again, it's a seminal work. Educators picked it up, librarians picked it up. A big reason we see comics in classrooms, and a big reason that comics are sort of expansive in what they mean uh, going forward. But we're going to start with, with his deficits, the Klaus definition. And we're going to use that to go farther, and I, I recommend that if you get into comics, we'll just start there, we'll keep going. So his definition is juxtaposed pictorial and other images in deliberate sequence. My fist, there's a nice box around it. My fist again, there's another box around it. Between these two boxes, nothing happens. Comics are static and they are flat. But you all make the action happen. You all animate. Okay? So comics, in comics, time has to happen in space. You don't move like movies where time is happening in the cogs of the wheel. 
They happen in the space of the page, and the reader is responsible for the, the making things happen. And, and, and thinking about its definition is one way we can think about time moving in comics in sort of a linear fashion. We move from winter to spring to summer to fall. Um, and, and yeah, so we'll say enough about that. And so that's, you can look at this page of mine and say, sure, you read it left to right, top to bottom, it's read sequentially, and that's how it should be. But at the same time, because it's visual, because of how we take in things more than one little spot at a time, you can't help but start to make connections from lower right back up to the top, and in multiple directions. Which means, if I ask this question very quickly, when you read comics, for those of you who do it, you know, at some point, but do you, do you read the words first? Who reads the words first? Few hands. I don't believe the rest of you, but who reads the, who reads the images first? All right, and who's got their third strategy? I'm working. I feel it. <laughs> you feel it. You take in the whole first. You... So the fact that you can ask that question. So even if, you know, you, sure, maybe you see this first, and then you look at this, and then that points you back. Like that thing about reaching, I open. Um, a, a, a separate fragment allows my joke to be possible here, because everything is held together by the fact that we take things initially. Um, so comics are acting in a slightly different way than just strictly sequential. Um, and I think that, to me, is their biggest power, to have this sort of linear structure, but also have that rhizomatic thing where things are interwoven in the ways that our vision works. Um, and I think, for me, if we think about how thinking works, you know, when, when you're here, you're at this talk, and you're going to go to something after, and you go to something after, so you're going to march through time in a sort of linear fashion. But things we talk about now are going to suggest things to you here. You're going to be going sideways, and you'll be thinking about things earlier, and you're going to be anticipating things in the future. So even as we're sort of marching straight through time, our thoughts are adrift in space. And to me, comics do this really interesting way of bringing sequential and simultaneous together um, that allows for a lot of narrative and a lot of ideas coming from possibilities, which is where we'll go from there. So I'll just give you a few examples of it. So this is a comic about the Louvre, by a wonderful French cartoons. If I were to give this to you in nine panels, separate, one at a time, what would you miss? What do you not see? You just get one at a time. The triangle. You miss the triangle. You miss the pyramid triangle, and if you know the loop, that's a pretty significant part of the of why this image is working. Um, this is Casting Alley in the 1930s. Our character bumbles sequentially through an otherwise simultaneous scene. It's a very strange thing. If you think about what's actually happening, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but it works in comics. Um, this is a joke, so when you get it, we'll uh, talk about it. So, our little guy here, the only way he can get the fruit is that he lives in comic book land where time and space are mashed up in a sort of unusual fashion. Um, you can move back in, you can move back in time, and I mean, you do these things that are really hard to explain. So it's a lot, it's more than just setting pictures next to each other. Something else is going on. Um, and so comics, you not only care about the things you draw in the spaces, you also care about the sort of holder, what the whole composition is doing. So when the McKay comic, the characters are interacting with the thing that's holding it. So the whole idea of space is kind of messed up. Uh, Nina Bailey's cartoon becomes a psychological space. You know, the frame eats her up. Um, so this is a page, and this is going to hint at the exercise we'll do when I'm done here. Um, this is a page of mine where I get the structure first, and that's become a big thing. Is like, how much do I, can I think about the shape of the structure to get the ideas across? How can the content come through the form itself? So I did the structure first, and from that, um, I figured out what was going in it. I knew the feeling of what was going in it, but I didn't know the specifics. So I wanted a routine job, and then I wanted sort of morning and evening to marry each other, and the commute to marry each other. Um, so there's the page. So, th so I made a book that has no repeating compositions at all. Each page has its own design, except for this sequence here. So this is the first time this happens. It happens again, and there's a slight disturbance. He discovers this little egg, and he has a thought. And the next time it happens, his thought has either grown, or this one very hungry caterpillar has started to eat the page. And by the last time it happens, the page has fallen apart. 
and the structure is falling apart, and that's part of the economy. So this idea of rather than illustrating, come back to how I started this, how can I get the form itself to do the work? So this, this is from the chapter on the ruts, the routine, and I'm contrasting the usual commuters out and back with my wife's commute in Manhattan, which was different every day, different paths, different endpoints all the time. Um, and so I could, in this one thing, I could say, here's, here's her commute, here's the regular commute. And I could do that in a sort of straightforward, here's one, here's the other. But I wanted to get a way to embody the work, to embody the idea in the very structure of the page. So the background, the 16 grid there, is repeating the same thing. Boom, 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 boom. It's darker, but it's the same image over and over again. In hers, I noticed how Manhattan looked a little bit like a leaf or a feather that, you know, as it's drifting down. And I could have, I could, because her, her walk was like a, was like a, a drifting, a, a, like that same kind of swaying. So, so I have these multiple layers of information sitting on top of each other. I mean, it's linear in some sense, sure, you read it one direction, but where to encounter the different images it starts to mess with you. It starts to, it looks pretty simple. There's a lot of density of information going on in it. Um, this is a page after the book, this is for the Boston Globe, uh, uh, comic about entropy. And the idea here was to talk about, you know, entropy's things run downhill, things fall apart. But I want to talk about the moments where things go against the stream, go against the flow, uh, things like life. And so the comic starts out in this very linear thing. You now this can't be put back together, your laundry won't pick itself up, um, your coffee will grow cold. So it's quite straightforward, and it continues as these things fall down the hill. But then it starts to show you here, and then the comic drops here, which is still fairly normal, but then all of a sudden the way that things go, you are forced to go right to left. And then you're forced to go bottom to top before you're sent back out of the pen, out of the comic. Um, you don't normally read right to left, I suspect, and you certainly don't normally read bottom to top. Uh, so, so we're not just talking about images and next to text, we're also talking about how we can use the space to convey ideas. And again, that'll be what we look at in a little bit. So for me, as somebody who draws very detailed things, the hardest thing is actually figuring out how I want you to move through it. And there's about 50 notebook pages that went into this, and you're like, here I finally found the structure, um, you guys do faster than I would do. So I really like this. I mean, we tend to think of comics as uh, pictures and illustration. I mean, sorry, prose and illustration. Um, yeah, text and image, whatever. We tend to think of it as that. But I think this is a better definition here that Cartoonist has the poetry plus graphic design. So if you think about the pyramid one, if you were to lay it out as nine things, it loses a lot of its meaning. In the same way that if you took a poem that has this nice rhythm to it and just said, here's a line of the poem, the whole thing is one, it loses its structure. So I think comics are in some ways sort of incompressible like poetry. So the, the first side of the argument is that I think comics are a really uh, wonderful way to represent the complexity of our thinking. They're, um, they're a way to get at, at the ways that our thoughts are both this sort of linear sequential flow, but have the tangents, have all these things that, all these ideas you have when you're out running that you're not quite sure how you fit them on a line of piece of paper when you come back inside. Um, so that's one half of it. The second part, which we'll sort of move toward the ending here, is that they're a really powerful way to generate our thinking. Um, and so, you know, I, I think we can think of drawing as a way to have a conversation with ourselves. Um, I worked alone, but I think having my drawings was this tremendous, uh, tremendous collaborative. Uh, you know, your visual system is doing all these things all the time. It's making all these decisions. It's, looked, it's making relationships. And when you put it, you put it to work in looking at a mark you make, you start to discover things you don't expect. You start to see things you don't expect in a cloud. You start to see things you don't expect in, in a stain on the carpet. So I get the question, do you think of words first or pictures? And I say yes. <laughs> because I put these things together, and in some way I feel like I almost let go. Because I have an idea I want to explore, I have some ideas for images that might work, and then I start trying to figure out how they work together. And it's very much sketching, repeating the sketches, and seeing things accidentally in the work that sends me in directions that I need to go. So I share this to be produced in the book. This is the very first sketch. And I really enjoyed sharing process sketches, which we're going to end with a couple process things. Um, because I, I think for people who don't draw, you tend to see finished work as sort of magic. You know, it's a large, full-born like Athena. It, it, it's, 
you know, but, but to see the mess that we go through, the struggle that you go through, the iterations that you go through, I think starts to make something that you can do. Um, I also like to show it because I think that one might say this is a picture of my thinking, but I don't think that's true. I think this is my thinking. Without this, I, I can't make this work. I can make something else, but I didn't write a whole bunch of words and then say, what pictures go with it? I had to do this, and I had to discover where I was going through doing it and doing it again and again. So I want to give you one very detailed example and one slightly more general one to wrap up here. And uh, so this is a page about, about multimodality. And the hard thing about the work I make, or I think it's hard, um, is that I have no narrative, no story. This is, not a, this is about ideas. And I have, as I said, I pulled out, there's no narrator. There's no me walking around to like hold the words and things. And there's no characters, there's no story. So each page, I have to figure out, all right, what's the page going to be about? What am I going to explore here? Um, what sort of visuals will start to carry that? What will work for that idea? And then how do I want the reader to experience it? So those kinds of constraints are sort of the genesis of it. I don't work in color, so I think the multimodality page in particular would be quite different if I had color as an option. Um, so here, I started with this idea of an omelet. Seemed like a good thing, an omelet, and it's got lots of different flavors, but they're kind of all whole. And with multimodality, sorry, I should stop. Multimodality, a familiar term to this whole room. But if it's not, you don't have to nod. Uh, sorry, and teachers all like, they just say, of course we know, and everybody else is good. Um, if you're not, it just means that it's not just words between us that's carrying the message. It's our, it's our gestures, it's our it's images we share, it's color, it's actions, all those other channels of communication that we tend to ignore in things like textbooks and tests, um, but are really part of the communication. <coughs> Comics are obviously pretty inherently multimodal, and I think the kinds of things we're talking about. So the you know, it gets many channels across in its single thing. It's not a smoothie where they're all losing their you know, singular identity. Green pepper is still identifiable when you bite it in your own. Um, it seemed okay, but I wasn't thrilled with where I was headed with it. So I tried a keyboard, like, and I was like, all right, you press each one, it's a different mode. Like, that's kind of all right. And then on the same page, I drew a sort of orchestra fit symphony, which is maybe the more typical one for all to go I was like, all right, that's kind of neat. And when I drew it on the same page, I noticed that the way I draw on the keyboard, um, that early keyboards, early typewriters, um, early typewriters were semi-circular or whatever, the amphitheater like. And the space bar is where the conductor was, and I was like, well, that's pretty cool. I didn't know I was going to do that, so I like it. So I'm kind of excited about that. So I made some other sketches, do a head, like, all right, got all these things, but they only come out through this sort of thin channel. So I draw on that and try it a couple times. My shorthand version, because you know, once I draw it once, there's no reason to draw it in any kind of detail again. So I, I'm like, so I drew it quick. This time I drew it quick, I'm like, wow, that looks a lot like the keyboard I drew. So I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. Now I've got something else going. So I've got this keyboard, I've got the head, I've got things coming out. And what I'm also going to have is a little, a little paragraph uh, that sets up what is multimodality. So I'm going to introduce the concept. So things are coming together. Uh, I've got main image, I've got this little setup, and I have one big problem. And it's a like particular to comics problem, so I won't let you answer that because I need to know. Um, but I'll say the problem, I'll just tell you guys for the sake of time. The problem is that I have you reading, I have you reading, I have you reading, and I put you here. And I've given you no way to come back up. And it's a problem that I, I don't have all those uh, things, but I need you to get back up to experience the whole image. I have to get you there. Uh, so the cheat would be to use an arrow. Like that, you don't, you know, that's not cool, but you could do it. Um, so because I'm really struggling with it, I sketch this arrow. I'm like, well, all right, that's the flow. That's what I need to have. And when I did it, I noticed that that arrow was not that unlike my thumb. I said, oh, well, of course. This is a keyboard. Why aren't there hands on it in the first place? So now I'm like, things are coming together. I've got this hand. I've got the thumb. I've got a way to get back up. Now I just got to put the pace here. Easy. And so, you can see some of the decisions here. From the, upper, from the top, there's these clouds that are both clouds and there are thought balloons. There's a big gap between them and this other part. There's, some, there's the bubbles there that sort of keep you there. I'm not too short to see this. 
there's this thermometer that goes back to that example I gave earlier. It's like dropping you down and it comes to the guy's head. So you're sort of forced to stay on the left side. You stay there, you stay there, you stay there. And you hit here, and I get something odd here. It's not, it's not a squared off box, it's a curved off one. And that curve says, get up there. And it stops your, and it stops your reading and it says, you're going back up there. And there's a lot of other things that happen. But, but the whole page, you know, that's a short version of it, came about through this interaction between the rules I set up and trying to solve all these problems. It would have, you know, the things I ended up talking about would have been quite good. The last example I'll give is how the, the working and drawing made me do research I wouldn't have done. So in the chapter on imagination, I wanted to do something about the power of stories, the transformative potential of it. And very early I thought of Scheherazade's sort of story of the Knight's Tales, the stories within stories. It's something cool to draw, and so that I like them, it's very productive. So I had this thought, my, my scheme was going to be, I'm going to have, like her stories within stories, I'm going to have each image lead to another image, sort of zoom in, zoom in, either literally or metaphorically. And it's going to move across the page in the way her name feels, Scheherazade, whatever way that is. I'm going to use a Z in this case, but, but whatever way I was going to go. And so the story moves, and in the middle, I wanted to say, well, by story, I don't just mean the fanciful or the fantastic, but I also mean things like science. And so if I was writing, I probably would have written that sentence and stopped and said, well, that's what I want to say. If I was illustrating, I might have done that and maybe just drawn some science thing. But here, I'm trying to find some way, how does the page embody that idea? How does the very structure do it? And what, what represents that? What's the right thing? So I spent a bunch of time looking for the, the time that the Knight's Tale were written down, where they were written down, um, what's going on in science there? And I stumbled on the work of a man named Altusi, um, whose astronomical calculations in the 13th century, uh, somewhere on there, um, later were picked up by Copernicus to do his revolutionary work. Um, and I already had this page about Copernicus, so now lots of pieces are coming together. So I spent a couple weeks researching this obscure piece of Arab astronomy um, and dealing with the compositional structure that I had to solve all because the drawing asked me to do it, and all for what resulted in these three little panels. So I had to make sense of it enough, I had to learn it for myself in a way that I could then bring it back um, for that small thing. So the point there, that there's nothing in my outline, there's nothing in teacher's college, edu doctors of education that says you should go research Arab astronomy from the 1300s. But what the drawing said, you need to solve this, and you need to go. And so for me, I think the drawings really pushed me to do things I wouldn't have done. It pushed me to understand things in ways I couldn't. And so I want to end with not my work. And I want to show you once two more. And I may show a bunch more when we do our drawing, uh, depending on time. But um, I want to end with students' work because I, I know that the response I often get is, we get it, we're, we're, they're cool with this, but we don't draw. Like, this isn't going to be, we obviously spent some time drawing. You know, um, so I want to show this. This is, a, this is my postdoc at the University of Calgary. I call that called Comics as a Way of Thinking. He's an extremely shy student, um, not trained as a drawer, didn't leave trained as a drawer either. Um, but I think this is one of the most powerful things I've seen. I have three pages from it. Um, and I think you know, anybody who you grab off the street probably draws about as well as she's going to draw. Um, so this first, this first kind of page, got these very negative words, and she says sometimes she can feel the weight of the words on her shoulders. So she's doing already a lot of play of image and, and text going on with the weight of the words. Um, and then these positive words that are lifting this thing up, but she is strong. And she did a lot of play with the panel breaking, like I showed you guys earlier, the panel itself is a character in the story. So this is a story about a girl who couldn't fit in a box. And so the panel is both framed, but sometimes it's trapped, sometimes it's masked. And they laugh in the boxes that fit as she, as she contorted and twisted, unable to find her place. And then the final page. So she makes her own box on words, sounds, and pictures, and soon she learns that there is no need for borders, that boxes restrict her unnecessarily, so she can go anywhere she wishes. Um, I think this, this is something I don't think she could know about herself without working visually. And it's not because she suddenly became a master craftsman with her hand because she understood things about space. She understood that drawing was really about making relationships in space and organizing your thought. And I think that's something that's open to everybody, and I think it's really important for every curriculum to include it. You know, so, uh, 
I think that's that's what I want to end with to say. I think you know, as educators, bringing this stuff into people's lives really makes a huge difference, and I think that's where we need to go. So I'm really grateful to be part of this conversation because it's a good thing to be part of. Thank you. Take some questions for a little bit, and then I'll make you draw. So, unless you don't want any questions, then we'll just draw the whole time. Yeah. Yeah, oh, sir. When you make a PowerPoint, are you thinking about it in terms of comments? During in terms of what? Do you think of a PowerPoint in terms of comments? That's a fascinating question because PowerPoints are very linear and sometimes very frustratingly so. Like I want to go over here, and you know, I don't have to really think it through. So speaking. I mean, it's, it's also interesting, I mean, it's sort of related, like, like, I don't have a narrator in my comp. I don't have me out front explaining things, and I don't tell, the book doesn't say the book's about education and about discipline, so I tend to over-explain when I'm here, because I'm that narrator um, with holding the pictures up. Um, so it's a much linear, much more linear experience than, I, I don't, I like your question. Do you have a solution for me? No. Okay. No. Have you used Prezi? I have. <laughs> I have, but well, it just does. It has. Yeah. Right. You do have more. I think maybe I just don't know it well enough. Mostly, I tend to see things that make me dizzy. But I have. I have. But I have friends who love it and do some really cool stuff in it. So I, I, I just, I should be careful. On that. I think the multimodal part is you walking around, me looking down at my notes. Right. Me, just disappearing for a couple minutes because I want to think about something else. Yeah. Just disregard you. Hey. The non-linear part <laughs> is is just driven in part by the power. Right. The no, that's true. But it does it does become like trying to like I want to put this over here sometimes. You can't. It's a different. It's a different thing. I um, I tend to make comics that don't do what my talks do, um, which which I know for some people they really prefer things that are much more sort of straightforward in how they have to read them. Um, you know, I, I know I make pages that are challenging. To people. They ask you to do some strange thing. Um, that's how I like it. I mean, I, I should say, like my definition of comics, I think every maker's definition of comics reflects how they work, not necessarily how comics actually are or are. But, yeah. Wouldn't you agree that traditional comics, the kind I grew up with, are completely different? They're just linear? You don't actually see the whole thing together? Um, more like just illustrated books? I. Like Maybe. Veronica and Betty, or whatever those were. But you know what? I mean, here's what's so I'm a, I'm a tiny part of a project that my supervisor in Calgary got to study. Uh, huge grant to study every two percent of every comic produced from 1934 to 2014, um, and study everything from the staples, the number of ads, to the composition. And so, for part of it, the part that I was interested in is like, how could you write up a description to categorize the page? Okay, and so how would you like say, well, would you do it into tiers? Okay, like one tier, two tier, three tier, and how did that evolve over time? And I would say every strategy we have tried, the minute you look at an actual comic from our buddy and Veronica, Archie, which my, my he actually wrote a book on Archie comics, that's pretty cool, um, fails. Because the, the, the creators are both, I mean, they may be following sort of a reading path that's more straightforward, that's probably closer to true. But they'll do things like the character will be partly out of the frame because of a, I didn't show any of those kinds of things, but you see superhero comics a lot. Like they're jumping out of the frame and they cross it. But they do it, in, uh, you know, you see Betty's leg go down into the other frame. And sometimes it's just because they wanted to draw the character bigger. But, so I mean, sure, there, in some sense, yes, you're, of course you're right. There's simpler ways to get ideas across. But on the other hand, they did some real, I mean, Little Nemo's from 1908. Um, Oh, I haven't showed you that yet. That's the time this plays part. You're going to see Little Nemo in a second. I mean, and that's that, 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 I did show Windsor McKay where he's pulling. Those things are from, you know, 100 years ago. So, I, I mean, I think people, like artists, will invent ways to, they have these constraints and then they find ways out of it. I think it's a lot more like painting than we think it is. Which is why, I mean, I, I think any structure, you, any categorization you try to give it fails because. People have to break it, and, and, and the most <laughs> mundane comics do it. But you're obviously totally right, also, that they were simpler in their intent. And and I'll say, as somebody who reads to my three-year-old, 
Um, comics are really hard to read. I mean, they're really hard to read out loud, period, because all this stuff is happening at once. I mean, even when you read My Little Pony comics, which are really chatty, um, there's a ton of text going on all the time, and it's going on here and here, and it's, it's really hard. Whereas picture books, even more sophisticated stories in picture books, are pretty easy. You know, there's, there's, a very clear, there's a clear way of reading it that, that breaks down in comics, and then breaks down even more in anyway, I'll stop. Is it, is it you or your three-year-old that has trouble with the idea that it's not in sequence? <laughs> because what you, you mean present, the the reading them or reading the comics? Yeah, because I'm, I was thinking about the way I read comics, and I don't. I, I mean, I will sometimes read the box here, and sometimes yeah. I read something oh, yeah. and I don't care about that issue. But you're not reading, reading it out loud, that. right? Well, you read it out loud sometimes. <laughs> you by yourself. <laughs> Let's talk about that. <laughs> um, but I think no, I, I, reading them because you can do that. You read at your own. It's when you read out loud. You know, I have to point like which character is saying it, which which person is doing it, and then there's things like, well, there's this bam, or somebody interrupted, but their conversation is continued, and it all makes sense visually because you can do what you're doing. You can go around like this and and take it in and make sense of it. But I but reading out loud is hard in comics. I, I don't, well, I'll get examples. Yes. Well, it's very similar to, graph, as you mentioned, graphic design, because you yes. might be designing a double-page spread for an annual report, and you might have small little things going down the side, or you might have a bigger picture, or insets. And you have to imagine how all those things could flow and be beautiful, and the page are very attractive to hold someone's attention. But it's actually the same, because you have these, you know, you're, you're, you're telling a story. So it's, it's basically grid. You know, you're, you're graphing yeah. and you're illustrating whether you're using pictures or drawings or and little bits of words right. to pull something out. No, absolutely. To, yeah. to give a presentation and, and affect someone. I think you're right. I think that's why I like that passage from Tufti. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's not a passage, it's just listen to him. But, um, but I think, you know, people ask me a lot when I'm like, have you ever thought about animation? And I kind of wonder if they heard the whole talk, but um, it's all about the, the, the very static, the flat and static nature of comics, that you can do these kinds of readings at your pace. So that what's, to me, that's what makes them really powerful. And, you know, animation is a different, it's got its own different beauty, but not that. I'm going to jump to the one comic stand in you. Oh, well, I was just on the, on the cinema stuff that everybody always wants to talk about. This is desire to see the engagement level of the reader. Cinematic, I think of comics because they're in sequences. It's a little simple. Right? Yeah. But cinema it engages a different type of your brain, and you have to follow it in time. What you're seeing with comics, in particular in your comics, is that when you flip a page, there's that graphic design sense that unifies the entirety of the page, and you get this engagement, re engagement thing that's happening in different modes. Yeah. You know, and it becomes a complete unit for a page. So the difference between that and cinema is like the difference between the reading experience and cinema. Right, you know, that's good. You can be reading a book, stop for a second, right? And give the change to your bus driver on the subway or whatever. And, and then go right back to where you were. Whereas if you were watching that movie, you've got to well, stop it, go back, right. rewind, all that. Right. So right. you disengage. You disengage. Right. And just so you know, I'm going to move to the next person. Robert Barry, the author of Ongoing Ulysses Scene, adaptation of, of Ulysses in the comics. Um, she'd ask me a question about it. Who also teaches here? The plug. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I, only, I only know three people in the room, so. <laughs> um, yes. Well, that moves directly with the comics. Oh, I tried. That's why I asked you first. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I, my impression is that, that your work is very autocratic. Autocratic? Yes. I know about it. It's very structured and you have a very definite idea about how you're going to oh, I make mean. this page. Yeah. Yes, and no. I mean, there are some pages that are, oh, you can't, I can't control it all. I can only make sure that right. I know how I intend it. Right. If I don't want to follow you, don't want to follow me. Down, right. But you have a very specific idea about you know, where it's going to go. Right. And sometimes I have a very specific idea that I want you not to know, and then that's a different problem. But yes, I think she likes this. I know. But yes, yes. No, but uh, comparing it to poetry, for instance, mm -hmm. or to a, a work of scholarship, 
you know, I mean, when you're reading, it's a linear process, but your mind is constantly drawing associations right. with what you know from the past, new ideas that are springing up. You know, I mean, it's it's a three-dimensional process. Sure. So I, you know, you can bring it to poetry. I mean, all poets say, you know, when you're reading poetry, you're actually creating poetry. Sure. In, in the process. Oh. 